All right, everyone, here we are on a podcast with all the editors who have been working night and day to report and bring us stories from this new terrain we're all living in, in the post or current COVID world. <laughs> when do we get to the post COVID world? <laughs> yeah, it's been crazy. And like, um, and we're going to talk about lots of things today. Uh, clearly, Chris, I think one of the challenges I- I'm finding is just like, it seems like every day there's a new thing happening like you wake up and it's kind of altering the way we're seeing things and it's tough to keep up from an editorial perspective uh yeah it is we have literally yeah we have been trying to just keep our head above water here because uh, we've been covering this for a few weeks but it all seems so distant and then it was just like wait 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 and then everything crashed down at once and so it has been uh crazy but uh, uh, jen and Catherine and you have really pulled together and i think you know I just want to let our listeners know our kind of guiding principle here is how can we be of help to people? What can we do to tell them about what's happening? Um, you know, a lot of our readers are startups. A lot of our readers, they work at CPG companies. They work across sort of the meal journey. Uh, and we're really trying to suss out uh, and provide um, not a lot of noise, but a lot of signal to help everybody get through this. Because it's really, honestly, like this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in my lifetime. This is the, the craziest uh I, I hate to use the word dire, but it is just like, Mike, I, I think you would agree nothing this big has ever happened in our lifetimes. I mean, the closest thing is, is 9-11, right? And I feel I've seen a couple of people say this. I mean, I'm certainly not the first, but like, it's, it might be our world war. I mean, certainly China went on a war footing pretty early. Um, I, I, I get uh, very aggregated, fr- aggravated and frustrated in today's social media time world when you see people on Facebook staying, it's still nothing to worry about. Um, so much as it, of it can be attributed to, you know, your your biases and the new sources you listen to, but also just an inability to understand basic math. But <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, it's unlike anything, I think, and I think it changes the landscape. And so that's one of the things we're dealing with as journalists. What does that altered landscape look like? And then be like, not just like reporting that, but I think like, what, how can we, how can we as a community, if you and your specific vertical use innovation or, or technology or whatever to, to react to this new reality. I think that's an important thing that we're covering. We, we, like you said, we're working night and day, just doing our best to help you kind of figure this out. So we are going forward. Uh, Jen, the biggest thing that has happened just in the past few days has been restaurants. Can you just, I mean, I know everybody knows this probably at this point, it's kind of hard to avoid, but just give us the big picture tectonic shifts that are happening in the restaurant industry. What's happening right now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess starting, really starting over this past weekend that we just had, um, cities, it started with cities like Seattle and then has very quickly in a matter of hours moved on to entire states uh, mandating that restaurants, bars, wineries, nightclubs, all of those entertainment venues close. Um, And you know, the list of states that there are a couple of states that are, we'll say, encouraging restaurants to do that or Washington, D.C. is telling restaurants, you know, you need to reduce the capacity in your restaurant by 50 percent. The majority of states that have made moves around uh, controlling restaurants, though, have said shut it down. Um, and that's that stretches across the entire country. That's New York City, but it's also, you know, I'm sitting here in Nashville right now, and that's certain places here. That's Kentucky. That's, you know, Washington State shut it down. Um, And then what you also have are individual um, hospitality companies and restaurant brands are also just masses of them now are also closing down their restaurants. And it started with you know, maybe a little bit more higher end things like, uh, you know, every, <laughs> every casino in Las, on the Las Vegas Strip, pretty much, and all those restaurants in there. Uh, you know, David Chang shut his Momofuku uh, restaurants down, Jose Andre with his. Now we're seeing your basic restaurant chain, Starbucks, McDonald's, Taco Bell, Dunkin'. I mean, I, we could sit here for the next 10 minutes and just list all the businesses that are closing. But the, I think the big thing to note here is 
is that most of these places, uh, particularly the chain restaurants, are they're closing dine-in operations. They are basically pivoting to this, what we were headed in already before all this started to happen, which is this off-premises model where you can still place an order for delivery, for drive-through, in some cases pickup. You just can't sit in the dining room. So I think, you know, that does a few things. One, it keeps workers employed, which is hugely important because restaurant workers by and large do not have things like uh, paid time off. Um, and it also, you know, it allows people to order food without, um, to just continue to get access to food without, while still being able to do the social distancing that is really important right now. So I guess that's that's kind of the big picture of what's going on right now. And I'll just add to end things that, um, you know, it's it's changing so quickly. It, it, I'm not exaggerating when I say that every single hour, it seems like there's a new development and a new sort of direction and a new level of intensity. So, you know, this is going to continue to do that for some time, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not surprising that the restaurant closures would have a big impact. I wrote a post this morning on like how drastic the drop has been. New York city traffic was down 70% as of Sunday. And what's surprising is that's before <laughs> the mandatory shutdowns. Um, but what it's, it's got me think about um, quite a bit is like, and we talked a little bit about this on Slack or what the long-term implications are and how this permanently changes the landscape. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see permanent changes to landscapes and does this force, like, a, a behavior change on the part of consumers, if we, you know, when we get out of this COVID uh, kind of danger? And then, B, do restaurants who have shifted their model to delivery just stay that way? And does it force the, an adoption of a, a cloud kitchen model more quickly? Like, that's one of the things I'm starting to think about, like, what are the permanent shifts that are going to come out of this? Yeah, I mean, I I absolutely think that in in some cases the we're going to see places stick to this off premises to go only model for sure. I think what's really concerning to me is um, it's this is going to put restaurants out of business, mm -hmm. um, smaller independent restaurants who don't have you know they're operating off super thin margins to begin with. Um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of permanent restaurant closures. Um, but I also think, you know, just not to be, I want to be somewhat optimistic here. I think we're also going to see new ways for these restaurants to set up delivery more easily. Uh, setting up delivery is not easy for a small restaurant that doesn't have a lot of money to spend. So um, we're already kind of seeing delivery companies start to change the way they do their commission fees and change uh, what they're offering these smaller independent restaurants. And so uh, in order to get them onboarded with a delivery program faster, so we could actually see some, uh, some encouraging movement around that to come out of all of this. A lot of restaurant uh, restaurants were complaining already. You know, David Chang's been out there saying delivery is basically going to put a lot of these people out of business. So the, the fee models, I think, um, are going to be restructured. You know, stepping back, and this is less of a restaurant conversation, is I, I, I no doubt think that there's going to be a lot of companies that go out of business, but it'll be interesting to see. And while we don't want to get too much into like governmental response, um, I think that like we're already hearing Republicans talk about things like universal basic income. I never would have thought I would have seen that. Uh, uh, Andrew Yang probably shouldn't have got out of the race so quickly. Um, um, and then I think this, this morning, I think the Trump administration floated a, a literally almost a trillion dollar bail package uh, for people. So um, I wonder if some form of relief will come in the form of like actual cash payments to small businesses, cheap loans, et cetera. And that's, that's getting a little bit out of our purview. But uh, it, that's definitely one of these things I think we're going to need to watch. Yeah, I, you know, part and parcel with the idea of delivery, the, what I wonder is it's, it's one thing to move people to delivery, but also what is the, the, what is the training that's going on for these you know, people that are being brought on board real quick? I, it's funny to me, like I've been wondering because I've been getting a ton of – I've just been – 
just been buying the hell out of everything on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, but when boxes come, should I bring the box inside? Who's been touching the box? You know, like it's been a really weird feeling because you read different thing about how long it stays on different in surfaces. And, you know, I, I don't know how, how long I am from turning into what was the, who was the aviator? What was it? Leo DiCaprio, you know, mm. uh, <laughs> Howard Hughes. Hughes. Yeah. Yeah. Where I'm walking around in tissue boxes or something, but like, uh, you know, I, I outsmarted myself the other night. I ordered a pizza on Friday night and was just like, I try, I paid for everything online and then realized I had to sign for it. And then I was like, oh, and then I was like, oh, and then I used the guy's pen. Did you bring your own pen? (laughs) No, I didn't. Like, I was like, oh, crap. I didn't use the, the, I should have brought my own pen. And then I was like, oh, I know, you know, people have to get used to being okay and overreacting. I was walking my dog. I was walking my dog like the other day. This is worse getting into random stories at this point. Like, as I brought it near my home, this guy got out of this van. Like, he was missing some teeth. And he just, he tells me how much he loves dogs and starts pushing his hands. (laughs) petting my dog and I'm just looking at his hands on my dog's fur. I'm like, oh, there's definitely COVID on there. Yeah, so. but the dogs can't get it. Dogs are immune. I know, but I have to pet the dog. Yeah, that's that's yeah Mike can. <laughs> just get one of those like little hand claws and you could just use that to... Goodbye, Ellie. Back scratchers. Nice yeah. selling you. And I gave Ellie to the man and I haven't seen her since. <laughs> Your and dog she's now. Happy now. Yeah. <laughs> you touched it, you got it. Your dog. Uh, uh, but one of the things I think is uh, inspiring... Um, is I think we're seeing people um, starting to be more resourceful, obviously just like from a, um, the the heroes on the front lines in grocery stores and and, and, in restaurants and the people (laughs) trying to uh, doctors and people like giving out vaccines, like and doing tests, like uh, amazing to watch, but also just um, the resourcefulness of restaurants. And so um, they're not like the heroes, like the guys who are giving out vaccines or, or watching like, People like Canlis, like the most expensive restaurant in Seattle, like suddenly convert to like giving out, like creating a drive through hamburger stand. Like it's really pretty interesting to see these companies and how resourceful they're being. Catherine, you were out there today checking it out, right? I was. So yeah, for those who don't know, Canlis is the most expensive re- restaurant in Seattle. You're you're spending three or $400 when you go in there normally. I've never been, shockingly, but I did go today for the first time. Um, starting today, they are doing these three different, they've, they sort of reinvented themselves, closed the dining room. And this was even something they announced last week before the mandatory closures in Seattle. And they pivoted to do three takeout only um, services, one bagels in the morning. You could either drive in or walk up. I walked up uh, to lunch drive through with burgers and salads and three uh, dinner you can take away. It's a different offering every night and you get a bottle of wine. So I did go today and shockingly, so did a lot of other people. I thought I was being like crafty and cool being the first one to go, but there were probably 60 or 70 people in line waiting and the cars backed up for blocks and blocks and blocks. But it was really interesting. I chatted to a lot of people in line. It was a lot of uh, Seattleites who are now working from home and just like have the flexibility of time to go to something like this. Also want a reason to get out of the house. And someone like Canlis, who already has a lot of like media attention doing something like this, especially doing it preemptively before restaurants had to close, they got a lot of media buzz around it. Um, so I was maybe not so super surprised to see so many people, but it was a little shocking and everyone was standing actually quite close together. So I was like, is this um, really helping the problem? I'm not so sure. But um, they had some bagels. They were good. I got a bagel sandwich. Definitely pretty expensive, I'd say. Like you're not going to be an average person getting this bagel. The sandwich was $10 for like an egg and cheese on a bagel and pretty good. But, you know, it just got me thinking something like Somewhere like Canlis can afford to do this and people will flock there because it's well known and it has a lot of reputation that it can fall back on. But what about all the other neighborhood spots where people are not going to go wait 45 minutes outside in the cold? And then by the time I was leaving at 930 and it starts at eight, they were sold out. So all these people who had been leaving, who had been waiting, said to turn around and go like it's a for fun thing, but it's not a practical thing like that model. While I admire it and I think it's interesting, um, it's not going to work for most restaurants where people are not yeah. patient enough to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, we they're like the the the, the major league, the New York Yankees of restaurants in Seattle, right? They're like the big ones. People are going to go there. Mm-hmm. It's right. like it's the smaller guys, the mom and pops, 
um, who aren't chains, who don't have like the financial wherewithal. And to that end, we, we started to cover a little bit some of the, uh, the companies actually lending a helping hand. Um, mm-hmm. I certainly like, obviously, the, the, the delivery guys like dropping fees and kind of onboarding. Um, we've also had some other examples of people just writing into us. Um, Chris, you know, one of the things we were trying to do is actually put together like essentially a resources and, and some resources for people to kind of find that information. But there's certainly been no shortage of technology companies and platform companies trying to step up to the plate to help these smaller guys. Yeah, it's funny. I, we wrote about uh, Chowley today, which is uh, they do point of sale software. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jen. And they, well, yeah, they and they point of sale. Yeah, and they offer they're helping restaurants pivot. All these companies are figuring. All, all these point of sale companies are like, oh crap, nobody's no none of our restaurants are going to do indoor dining anymore. So they're pivoting to try and help them figure out delivery. Um, and it's such a, it's, you know, in the case of Chowley, they were offering like a 60 day free trial and no setup fees and all this other stuff. But it's, it's when you, when you take a step back, you realize it's not, it, it is, it's, it's like turning a battleship for a restaurant to switch from a dine-in model to a delivery model. Right. And it is, you know, thankfully some, you know, restaurants and, and delivery services like DoorDash announced something today to try and help out and Uber is doing something to help get these restaurants uh, delivery ready. But there's a whole infrastructure underneath that needs to happen. Um, and so it's not just like, oh, we're just going to become delivery, right? Like it, there's a lot that goes into it if you're mm-hmm. a restaurant, especially you've been doing your business one particular way for your for decades. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of social media things of from businesses, especially in the Seattle area, restaurants that are saying we're um, going to be completely closed for all orders during this week as we try to figure out how we pivot to even just a takeout only model where you don't have to suddenly like find third party delivery services, but even just reinventing your menu to be takeout friendly, like that alone takes a lot of work. And then you have to figure out your inventory, you have to figure out your, what can pack and like transit well, transport well. And so that alone, even just transferring to be like, okay, now you're all just taking this to go is a huge undertaking. This is where a company like Charlie can help address things is if you are pivoting to delivery and you're trying to work with more than one, let's say you want to work with, I'd like to do Postmates, DoorDash, and Uber Eats. Um, That's a lot. You can't just (laughs) click a button and all of a sudden all those orders from all those disparate sources are coming in to the ticket stream. I mean, it's a, you know, it, it's a huge logistical challenge for restaurants. And, you know, I think it's great to see a company like Chowley stepping up and saying, hey, we're going to try to help make this easier uh, for you to just operationally make this shift, which isn't going to be easy no matter what, but maybe a little bit less painful with some of these moves by these restaurant tech companies. The one thing I'm wondering is uh, I reached out to Starship to see if they had seen an increase in uh, requests for their delivery robots. I realized that there are still regulations in place in cities about using delivery robots, but I would imagine like in the city of San Francisco where they're in a shelter in place, like having to deal with pedestrian traffic suddenly got a lot easier, right? Because Mm -hmm. people are needing to stay home. And the thing about autonomous robots is you can, you know, they can travel in a city like San Francisco in a particular neighborhood there. I would imagine they're pretty easy to clean out. Uh, if you follow certain protocols, because they're all hard surfaces and you can wipe them down or spray them or UV light them or whatever you need. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, they said that they'd seen an increase, but it didn't seem like anything big uh, from what they, from what they told me. Like there hasn't been like a surge and like, Oh, we can't keep up with the number of people who want mm-hmm. robots. But they're also a lot on college campuses, right? And a lot of college campuses are either emptied out or students are, are not really hanging out around there because their classes are all virtual or canceled. Right. But I I guess what I'm wondering is just like the um, restaurants seeing, uh, looking, uh, exploring autonomous as an, as an Mm -hmm. option. Right. They try to ramp up because the logistics part, right. Like I, I haven't worked in a delivery only restaurant, but you can't just, I would imagine if a limited number of resources and an influx of orders, you don't want to just have one driver send out one order at a time as they come in. You want to probably bulk them together so that you're taking advantage of 
geographies and traveling and all of that stuff. So, you know, yeah, the ability to wonder, do that through software. Yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, because this week really seems like the big restaurants have to close or pivot. You know, that that's the big news for at least this first half of the week. I feel like in the second half of this week and going on into next, we're going to start hearing a lot more about, uh, okay, the, if this is the new reality, what are the strategies folks are using? And I wonder if we'll hear more about autonomous delivery in like two days or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I have one word for you guys, drones. <laughs> Maybe this will accelerate regulatory approval for drones. I mean, that's talk about autonomous robots making things easier. Drones are a, a snap. <laughs> <laughs> and that sound was the teeth grinding of every drone operator that yeah. exists. <laughs> I mean, I think the sales cycle um, and kind of adoption of some of these things will take longer. I think the near-term kind of dynamic nature of certain kind of changes um, in, in certain areas are, is more apparent. One of those, I think, is um, – Chris, you were talking to um, the person who runs Farmstead or someone affiliated with Farmstead, and like they saw a, a pretty dramatic shift in their business because of coronavirus. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Farmstead is a small-ish online grocery store based in the Bay Area that services the Bay Area, I think between San Rafael, some East Bay, and down to San Jose. Um, and they're online only. They create little micro hubs in neighborhoods. But they said, uh, you know, up until all of this, the, a good week for them was a 10 to 12% bump week over week in business. And sort of three weeks ago, when it first started, when Corona first started, like, becoming, oh, crap, this is going to be a big thing. Uh, they jumped, I think, 40%. And then the second week, it was 50% over that previous number. And then in the third week, when people really started to panic and and lose it, like their, their business went up 70% over the previous week, week over week. So it's, they've seen it just skyrocket and they are struggling to keep up with demand. They have to basically double their head count to get delivery drivers. Um, and they have a couple of interesting things. I'm putting together a story on it now, but their hook was they have a, an AI based uh, prediction management tool, uh, so that they can keep, uh, Inventory. So their inventory was always just the right amount of inventory in their store. They didn't have uh, excess go to waste. They didn't under deliver. They had just the right amount. And so this has sort of been pushing their algorithms to the test, but they said they've been able, they haven't been running out of product uh, or their supply, their product supply is still good. They may run out of um, milk, especially at the beginning. He said pasta was the biggest thing everybody was buying. Everybody was stocking up on pasta. And so they were, they sold out of that. Um, but they do a couple of interesting things. And one of them is that when you go and you go online and order that it doesn't give you an out of inventory message, you click on it and then you learn it's out of inventory. And while that might be frustrating for the user, what that does is that gives them data on what products people want, even if it's out of stock. So they don't, a customer doesn't know that pasta is out of stock yet, but they're still going to click on it. And then they get a message like, I'm sorry, this is out of order. But then Farmstead is able to still collect that data. Now, when I went on like Safeway the other day, I could see a bunch of grayed out products like, oh, we don't have this right now. So I didn't click on anything. So as a consequence, Safeway doesn't really know what I really wanted. And so Farmstead is able to sort of put all of this into its algorithms uh, in order to to keep up with demand. But yeah, he was just like, it's just been crazy. And everybody, because Bay Area is in shelter in place, all the grocery services are seeing just surges in demand. And people were wanting fresh fruit from them, weren't they? I mean, yeah. one of the, I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, he said that normally, you know, it, before these times, people wouldn't really order produce online because they want to go and see it and touch it and feel it. And I can't, you know, the number of things that I want to touch anymore has gone down drastically in the past couple of weeks. Uh, and so more people are buying produce. And because he's a warehouse and not a grocery store, that means that fewer people are touching the products that they sell uh, and produce among them. So it's, this is, we talked about this before, but this is really sort of forcing the issue with a lot of innovation that we've been writing about. You know, it, it, people have been hesitant to buy groceries online. Now they're having to. People are hesitant about buying produce online. Now they're having to. So all of these systems that have been, you know, the grocery stores in particular have been putting into place are now really being put to the test. 
Yeah, I don't know where people are listening to this. If, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. We have stories from the front lines. Um, I was at uh, QFC yesterday. Uh, I think it's a Kroger-based grocery store in the Seattle area. And like, I was maybe at the grocery store a week ago and like everything was stocked up except for like toilet paper. <laughs> yesterday it looked like a post-apocalyptic like barren wasteland of a grocery store like it looked like i was in a scene from like walking dead like where half the stuff's gone like it was insane um i couldn't believe how much was off the shelves and this was like and then um the morning i went in the morning and there's no produce left and then i went in the afternoon to a different one and like everything on the normal shelves was gone it's crazy yeah canned goods good luck you're not getting them good so, time to learn how to cook yeah Although I, I will say that um, certain it depends where you go, um, like but certain grocery stores are just cleaned out. But like I can definitely see how companies like Farmstead and online grocery are getting a pop now. Um, mm -hmm. like, I, I I ordered a couple things from Amazon and the ship delay shipping timeline seemed a little bit delayed. I'm sure that they're just getting really stretched too. Yeah, everything is. Yeah, everything is. When I tried to get my Safeway order a few days ago, it, it's uh, delivery is a week and a half out. So. Guys, we're we're here. We're we're all working remote. Um, we're working day and night to bring these stories to you guys. If you have any stories that you guys think are interesting from the front lines, we um, one of the things in our editorial conversation before this, we just one of the things we wanted to do is highlight the stories of people out there, you know, on the front lines trying to innovate and, and think of new ways to do business. Um, give a shout out to us. Send us an email at tips at the spoon tech. Um, I think we, we'd appreciate hearing from you guys. Uh, Chris, I, I know we've, you've gotten a few emails. We've all been getting a few emails, but I think those are the kind of stories you want to hear from. Yeah. Tell us what's happening. You know, cause everybody, honestly, we are, uh, we're all on lockdown. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping like I haven't left my, I haven't gotten in my car. Oh, for a few days now. So uh, we aren't going anywhere. So let us know what's happening where you're at. Catherine, I just, yes. you, you went to, uh, before we go, did you eat the hamburger? Because you're a vegetarian. Like, or did you get like, did you get a bagel? I got a bagel. So for wow. breakfast, it's just bagels and cream cheese. Uh, but I did speak to some people who waited in line yesterday. They did the lunch thing. First of all, they sold a thousand burgers yesterday until they ran out. Second of all, they said it was only okay. Oh, really? I know. I think it's hard because you're paying quite a premium for like a highbrow fast food burger when you could just be getting a fast food burger and not have to wait in line for an hour. So that might affect things slightly, but yeah, they said it was pretty good. But um, yeah, I talked to some staff at Canlis who said they are expecting about a thousand burgers to be sold every day at lunch. So if you want one, you're in Seattle area, head on over, right. leave six feet of distance, please. Yes. Wash your hands, stay safe. And uh, you too, guys. Thanks for getting on. Yeah. And, uh, this yeah. Been good. All right, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.